Hello? Is this thing on? Hello? Yeah, it's recording. And it's episode 174 of Stand Up. Joining me today to talk about schools opening in Florida, my friend, the vice president of the Florida Educators Association, Andrew Spar, joins me. Then to talk about journalism and politics and more, another friend, the great Jeff Jarvis of the Craig Newmark School of Journalism. I am Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey, guys. Happy Wednesday. If you're listening in order, you made it to the middle of the week. It is day 1,314 of our long national nightmare. There are 69 days left until Election Day 2020. And what should I be doing here on the podcast in terms of promoting and plugging organizations and get out the vote organizations and different people running for different offices, local, state, federal? Let me know if you have ideas because I should be plugging different ideas and organizations and interviewing people in the next 69 days because that's all we have left of what we know of America, right? So let me know what ideas, what websites, what campaigns, and who you are supporting, and I will consider giving them regular plugs and maybe interviewing representatives or people from those organizations or movements. From Black Lives Matter to get out the vote to people running for local, state, And other offices, I'd love to talk to them. All right, so lots to discuss on today's show. First of all, just want to really quickly thank everybody who subscribes to the show, the paid subscription. We got uh, three new members of the stand-up community today. I'm excited to welcome Jonathan Cavanaugh, who just became a $5 subscriber. Scott Bialis subscribed for $5 as well. And one of my best friends in the whole world, who has been on the show and was a regular on the old show, Mark Preston, just signed up for $10. Thank you, Mark. Well, that's cool. It's always weird when you're funding your project, or in this case, my independent media journalistic endeavor with your friends. But a lot of my friends have subscribed to the podcast, my close personal friends. And I should say a lot of you have become close personal friends to me through the podcast as well. So thank you and welcome to Scott and to John and to Mark and two wise ass listeners, Jack Morocco, Dominic Metzger, both sent me dick pics of Dick Cheney. Yeah, I was joking about being sent dick pics and both those guys, Jack and Dominic, thank you for your Dick Cheney pics. Very funny. Jared writes me and says, Uh, Pete, I finally became a paid subscriber on Patreon after seeing you on a New Zealand TV show. I've been listening since I saw you a couple months ago on the same show and love your content and interview style. Keep up the good work. Uh, That's so cool. I didn't know that that was going to become anything. Maybe I'll become huge in New Zealand. That'd be great because then we could move there. Jared, you got a guest room? That's very cool. New Zealand subscriber. Thanks, Jared. Uh, A lot of people wrote me also to talk about yesterday's show. Episode 173 being coined Johnson and Johnson by one listener and subscriber. My friend Mayor C said, amazing interview with Johnson and Johnson. I hung on to every word. Thank you, Mayor. I'm so glad you liked it. Christine wrote, how about Dr. Jerry Johnson? Wow, what a jewel. Dr. Jason Johnson is an apple that did not fall far from that beautiful tree. I just loved her. And Teresa P. writes, Dr. Johnson's so amazing, Pete. I was trying to eat lunch while listening, but I had to stop because it just choked me up. So moving. And listening to Ty as well. Yeah, my friend Ty, I called him yesterday. He said, this kind of interview is so important as it educates us folks who grew up and sometimes still live on a different planet. In the same country. Such inspiring people. Keep it up, Pete. So appreciate you, Pete. Thank you, Teresa. I so appreciate you, too. Yeah, I feel like when I talk to people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different ethnicities, different ages, and people who are just a lot different from me or you, you get to listen in. And feel like you're part of that conversation. And I think that's super important. We're so segregated in our communities and 
sometimes we just don't have the the type of access that we would like to people who belong to other types of communities. And you wish you could change that, but it's not that easy. And so through the podcast and a lot of the guests that I'm bringing on, hopefully you do get to hear their voices, their opinions, their thoughts, and their experiences. And Ty did just that on yesterday's episode. One more email. Rosalind wrote, I love, love, love Dr. Jerry Johnson. I can't wait to hear more of her story. Great show. So anyway, thank you to all the listeners who are tweeting and writing and telling their friends. And of course, those of you that are paid subscribers, awesome to have you. Oh man, I watched the RNC tonight and I drank Heineken and smoked weed from a Nantucket dispensary. And then I pressed record on this. So I cannot promise you that this is the greatest opening of any of the podcasts that I've done in the last 173. But I still, my cheat sheet is the two of my cheat sheets are the uh, daily email from WTF just happened today. And the other one I love to use is today's big stuff. They're both really good and very informative, but WTF just happened today always opens with today in one sentence. And here it is. The FDA, quote, grossly misrepresented data about the use of blood plasma therapy to treat coronavirus patients. The FDA commissioner apologized for overstating the benefits of treating COVID-19 patients with plasma. The FDA commissioner, however, pushed back against Trump's baseless claim that the, quote, deep state is deliberately stalling coronavirus vaccine development at the FDA. New York and New Jersey sued Trump and Postmaster General Louis DeJoy over changes to Postal Service operations and the House Foreign Affairs Committee's sub-panel on oversight is investigating Mike Pompeo's decision to speak at the Republican National Convention. Yeah, the Secretary of State is not supposed to make political statements at political events like he did last night at the RNC from, by the way, Jerusalem. Very bad. Another norm broken. You're not supposed to be uh, appear that overtly political. Uh, Mike Pompeo is the number one or number two most dangerous person in the administration, and I think... The other one would be, of course, his attorney general, his consigliere, his Roy Cohn, his most loyal stormtrooper, uh, the disgusting Bill Barr. Uh, Trump's re-election campaign, by the way, has paid his private companies at least $2.3 million for rent, food, lodging, and other expenses, according to the Federal Election Commission filings. Trump, the richest president in American history, has yet to donate to his own campaign. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. It just, there is no bottom, as Dr. Aaron Carroll so often tweets. And by the way, Dr. Carroll is uh, the head of mitigation at Indiana University right now, has had every incoming student tested. Like, he's in charge. He got this uh, new job at Indiana University where he's been the head of research for a long time. Now he's in charge of making sure that the virus uh, doesn't spread at Indiana University. What an unbelievable stress, unbelievably stressful responsibility. Why we haven't heard much from him here on the podcast or in other media outlets, but uh, I'll get him on soon because he's basically one of my best friends in the whole world. So yeah, but that's uh, good on him. Uh, I was watching the RNC last night and live tweeting it. Did you? Uh, you probably didn't watch it. Why would you watch it? It was a real horror show. Night two was probably just as bad as night one. I don't know how you would rank them, but you heard from the first lady who gave an absolutely terrible, terribly delivered speech, although she did show uh, some sense of empathy for people who have lost somebody and we haven't heard much about the pandemic, but it seems like she gave more lip service to that than uh, anybody else that spoke last night or even tonight. Uh, We heard from a number of black folks again which is uh, enraging to me that people of color come out and try to somehow argue and uh, uh, stand up for the president's character and reputation. That's enraging to me and uh, pretty much all the black folks and people of color that I know, talk to, listen to, read to. But I tweeted that I thought it was weird. They were spending so much effort. I said the Trump campaign has spent a lot of time trying to win over black people And I'm going to go ahead and say, I don't think it's working at all, but I got a good take from a very smart person who wrote, I don't want to go say their name because it was a private message, who wrote to me, 
I don't think they're trying seriously to win over black people. I think they're trying to convince undecided white people that the GOP isn't racist to remove that barrier from voting for him. Yeah, that's a smarter take. Uh, Mike Pence showed up at Lincoln's log cabin to interview people for the RNC. And I was really hoping Lincoln's ghost would walk into the frame and slap stupid Mike Pence in the face, but no such luck. Unfortunately, we heard from the, uh, the, the Covington, uh, make America great again, kid. Yeah. I won't say anything negative about a minor. We heard from the uh, former Attorney General of Florida, Pam Bondi, who is uh, just a, a horror show of a person. And I, I found this out about her. I didn't I'd never heard this about her. First of all, uh, Trump made she was investigating Trump, apparently, for the campaign. And he made a twenty five thousand uh, twenty five thousand dollar donation to her campaign. And somehow the investigation into him went away, which was really disconcerting, obviously, in the height of corruption. Uh, But I didn't know this about her. Uh, Pam Bondi, I read last night, stole a dog from victims of Hurricane Katrina. She stole a dog from Katrina victims. Yeah, read all about it. I'll share the article in the show notes for today's episode. But a family had to fight to get their dog back from this woman. it's, it's, It's a horrible story. I'd never heard that until last night, Pam Bondi. Crazy. We also heard from Franklin Graham's daughter. I think her name is like Sussy or something. She uh, denied uh, trans people's identities and disparaged gay people in a kind of subversive way. She was awful. Who else? Uh, He pardoned a guy. uh, uh, Jamel Bowie from the New York Times said it was like, it was like Trump was giving a rose to the bachelor. He pardoned a guy on camera. He also made a bunch of people, American citizens. And, uh, that was a really disgraceful prop. The whole thing was the fact that it was at the white house and the secretary of state. It was a nightmare. Horrible. You don't have to watch it. You didn't miss anything. And I'm sorry I did, but I did have the aid of alcohol and uh, THC. So anyway, I should stop talking now and get to the podcast. How about that? Uh, My first guest is a guy who I've known for uh, quite a long time. He's a longtime listener of the show. And uh, years ago, he reached out to me and asked me to come down to speak at his teacher's union in Florida. And from that point on, we became pretty good friends. He is a role model and a very inspiring guy as a father, a husband, and as an educator and a union member and leader. And he helped lead the Florida Education Association to getting winning a major court case you might have heard about. The state of Florida filed an appeal. Well, the, the, the Florida Education Association won in a circuit court uh, that allowed the teachers to not have to go back into the school. It's a pretty uh, impressive and important win. Florida, Florida educators association, uh, the Florida education association and Andrew Spar is the vice president of that organization. And it's one of the toughest places to be a teacher in the United States of America, Florida, by the way. So I reached out to, and we talk about that court case and school and educators in general. We had a great conversation as always. And now I'd like to share it with you. There he is. Hey, Pete. Hey, man. Good to see you. Good seeing you. How are you on this? Uh, what day is it? Tuesday. <laughs> I know. I actually thought it was Wednesday for an hour this morning. <laughs> I had a, uh, a late. Back? Are you back in, you're back in your studio? I'm in the new studio. This is the new studio. This is the new studio. Yeah, and uh, last night, I, I I just walked in here. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late here. That's all right. Um, and um, it's really funny because when I walk in in the morning, I have uh, some subtle regrets about the night before. And this is, I'll only show you this. Um, this is what happened last night. Oh, you can't really see it. There are uh, four Heinekens, <laughs> a salad bowl, and a mini pie box. So, so, 
So it's, is the salad to, to offset the beer gut? I, that, that's for it? Is it yeah. To keep it somewhat balanced? I, yeah, it's <laughs> how I justify bad behavior. <laughs> all, right, all right, here we go. I've got him now. I've got him now, Andrew Spar. Thank you very much for joining me, buddy. A big win at a circuit court yesterday. Um, t- take us back a little bit to what your organization, which represents over 150,000 Florida educators, was demanding from the state. So, you know, the state of Florida, the commissioner back at the beginning of July issued an emergency order mandating that in order to get funding and a full funding for our district schools, that districts must open in person brick and mortar, regardless of what the medical experts are saying, what the COVID case numbers look like, what the community spread is. I mean, just completely irregardless to the safety of students and people who work in our schools. And so uh, we decided this was not a good idea. We uh, filed some court actions. Uh, The state did everything they could to try and delay this, uh, objecting to where we filed the case, um, getting the case moved to Tallahassee, where they have a home field advantage. Um, And so ultimately, it went before this judge. Uh, Literally, I think we ended up with five different judges assigned to this case before this judge ultimately uh, did it. A lot of judges did not quite honestly, want to have anything to do with this case. And so uh, so this judge uh, sped up the case, made sure it moved pretty quickly. Uh, um, he first heard an order from the state to dismiss the case. The state didn't want the case to go anywhere. They said it was uh, a frivolous lawsuit and should be thrown out. Uh, the, the commissioner of education here in Florida, when he was meeting with the president at the White House talking about education, said that we were despicable, I think was the term to use, or disgraceful, something to that effect. Uh, for filing this frivolous lawsuit. Uh, and then uh, he said at the beginning, he guaranteed 100% that they would prevail in this case. And so, uh, yeah, yesterday the judge disagreed. Yesterday the judge, and I got to tell you, it was a two and a half day trial on our motion to get a temporary injunction. Uh, the judge ultimately said that the state, in fact, did not consider safety of students and people who work in our schools and therefore ruled in favor of our injunction uh, to, uh, to, to allow school districts to make decisions based on the information they have without the fear of retaliation or threats. Well, without the fear of retaliation or threats, who is the Secretary of Education there in Florida, and why does he and the governor not necessarily care about educators, much less students? So the Commissioner of Education in Florida is a gentleman by the name of um, um, Richard Corcoran, And Richard Corcoran uh, was Speaker of the House here in Florida. He is a lawyer by trade, has zero experience in uh, education. Very smart guy, I'll give him that, Uh, but certainly has his own agenda. He pushed through the the most anti-public education pieces of legislation we've ever seen in Florida in his two years as Speaker of the House in Florida. Uh, This was legislation uh, that dramatically expanded uh, the privatization of, of education in Florida. Um, clearly someone who has had a connection to charter schools and voucher. They used the term, and they did throughout this child, this trial, that this is all about school choice. Uh, but it's hard for people to make choices and decisions when they're not given all the information. <laughs> and, and so that's really been the gist of this. It's, it's a false pretense. You know, uh, uh, our president, uh, uh, who's been on with you before, Fed, has said, Uh, This is like a multiple choice test, except when you do a multiple choice test, you assume there's a right answer. Yeah, there's there's no right answer in this case. I hate multiple choice tests. Uh, (laughs) What is the status? What is the current situation in Florida right now in terms of covid? What does your organization, Florida Education Association, want the situation to be before you send students and teachers back into brick and mortar buildings? And is it realistic? what your the the atmosphere that you want the education atmosphere that you want for kids in florida and educators so what we said and what the judge even agreed with and i think it's important this was a circuit court ruling the circuit court focuses on the facts of what is happening uh in our state and the facts of this case right and so what the circuit court judge said was that, in fact, you're right. It's not very safe in our schools right now. We have uncontrolled community spread. The numbers have gotten better in Florida. And quite honestly, the governor and the commissioner are celebrating that we're only having like 
three to 5,000 new cases a day when uh, back in May, we were having a few hundred cases per day, right? But they're celebrating three to 5,000 cases a day because it had gone up to 10,000 plus cases. But what we've seen here in Florida is that people are taking it more serious again. And so they're wearing masks more. We've seen a lot of business in, businesses implement mask policies. You know, you look at a lot of our colleges and universities, even though they're opening in Florida, which there's a concern, most of them are only doing about 25% of their classes uh, in person. Most of it has been moved online. Disney World is open in Florida. We talked about this before. Universal, they're limiting their capacity to like 20 or 25%. NASCAR just had a big race in Daytona recently. They limited their capacity to under 20%. But in our public schools, we're saying open wide up, let everyone in. Uh, without the measures in place. We have one school where they don't, most of our schools have what we call portable classrooms uh, for a lot of their classes. There's no running water in those classrooms. There's no way for kids to wash their hands. Uh, we've had 700 cases directly tied back to K-12 schools in the last two weeks. Wow. And only a small percentage of our schools were open during that time. You guys were set to open mid-August, the 15th, I want to say. 10th. Most districts were scheduled to open on the 10th. Most districts pushed that. Um, as of yesterday, um, we now have all, most of our districts open, and then there's another round that will finish up opening next Monday, the 31st. So students is probably what I should have asked first, but students are going to school right now? Right now in the state of Florida, uh, in uh, many of our, most of our districts at this point, there are a percent of students returning to the classroom. Uh, some districts, it's only about 40%, and other districts, it's as high as 70 or 80%. I don't know of any district where uh, all students are back in person. Many parents have opted to go online uh, in order to protect their kids. The, the, com the education commissioner threatened to fire uh, teachers who didn't uh, show up to school, show up to work, and explain, Andrew, if you don't mind, the, 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 the paradigm uh, for unions in a state like Florida, in particular, your union, because you guys uh, uh, don't have all of the same legal recourses that unions in other states do. What's the difference and what do you make of that threat? So so here's what happened. Uh, you know, again, what we've been seeing as they've been forcing teachers to go back. The commissioner also said in a lot of districts, they have 100 percent of the teachers reporting. Well, let's let's think about that for a minute. Your employer says you either report or I fire you. Uh, are you going to report? <laughs> you know, it's that kind of scenario. And that's what's kind of happened. So you've had teachers who have quit, uh, teachers who have retired early. Uh, leave of absences have gone up significantly. Uh, some of the districts that have reported, we've seen retirements about double what they were last time, uh, last year at this time. We've seen leave of absences, teachers who are taking time off because of COVID and not uh, coming to work. We've seen that quadruple in most districts over what is normally the case. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of people just not uh, coming back into the profession. And this is having, of course, an impact on a massive uh, teacher shortage. And then we had the commissioner say with teachers who are saying, I'm not comfortable coming in. I'm going to take leave. I'm going to take sick leave. Uh, we've got to figure something out. You have him saying, if you don't report to work, we're going to fire you. Well, first of all, the commissioner in the state of Florida has no authority. And he did say that later. Um, but again, I think for the commissioner and the governor in the state, this is like a political game, right? They're not putting the safety and health of our students and people who work in our school at the center of this. The judge said that in his ruling. This is a political game. They see the lawsuit as a political game. They're now appealing it uh, to the uh, first uh, district court of appeals uh, as a political game. They don't want to focus on making sure the support is in place to protect our students and to protect the people who work in our schools. And that's what we should be talking about, right? We should be talking about how do we ensure that when kids come back, it's done in a manner which is safe. 700 cases in two weeks tied back to public schools. You realize how many people could be affected, infected by that, right? Uh, th this, ha this is a virus that spreads fairly easily. And so you're talking about 700 confirmed cases in the last two weeks when a small fraction of our districts were open, what's going to happen two weeks from now? What's that number going to look like two weeks from now? That's a concern. And, and let me also add one more thing, Pete. The commissioner also told superintendents, don't close down schools if you have COVID cases. In fact, don't close down classrooms unless you talk to us first. And so 
again, that's why this lawsuit, I think, is so vitally important. We won where it matters. And what this judge said is, Commissioner, you don't have the authority to override school boards. School boards get to make this decision. School boards are elected by parents, by small business owners, by educators, by people in their community who they know, on a, in a lot of cases, on a first-name basis. That's who they should be accountable to, not a, a, a point of bureaucrat in Tallahassee. Well, couldn't be more right about that. Uh, w- w- congratulations on the win. They have now appealed it to uh, this appeals court. Uh, what is the timeline of that, and, and 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 what do you think will happen next? So this is the the, the crazy ride we're going to be on. Um, they have filed the appeal immediately yesterday, within hours after the ruling came out. Um, we now, uh, when they filed that appeal, they get what's called an automatic stay. It sets aside the judge's ruling at this point. We are filing paperwork today with the judge to say, uh, we want you to lift that stay. We think the judge will. He's the one who issued the ruling. Um, they will then go to the first district court of appeal and ask them to put the stay back in place. Um, and so we'll have to fight that. And, uh, you know, look, we, you can't count on courts to always, you know, be the solution. And right. so, again, to us, this is, this is more political. The, the uh, appeals court are all appointed judges. Uh, they've been appointed in Florida by, you know, the likes of, of Jeb Bush and Rick Scott and Ron DeSantis. Mm. So these are not people who necessarily ideologically line where we are. They may be very good people, but they don't necessarily have the same ideals and visions we do. I will tell you, this judge we had, we weren't sure where he was going to go. He's not someone who's known for ruling the way he did in this case. Um, so you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but look, the bottom line is this circuit judge looked at the facts, and the facts were that that the, the state of Florida overreached in this case, the commissioner of education uh, over, did an overreach, took away the power of the school boards and ignored the safety of students and people who work in our schools. And the, the commissioner wants to continue the political side of this, not the real world side. Of it. The chaos that's happening in your state regarding COVID and schools and so many other issues is a great example of of why elections matter and have consequences. When is the when is uh, Governor DeSantis term up and how much of a difference would it make if Andrew Gillum or frankly, just about anybody would have won that last Florida gubernatorial election? Yeah, you know, so the the governor is up in two years in 2022. Oh, that's going to be a long two years. Yeah. (laughs) And and so, you know, what we've continued to do is focus on working on both sides of the aisle. You know, Florida is a is a one percent state. It's referred to as a one percent state. Most elections that are statewide elections in Florida go one percent one way or the other way. Um, And and typically they've been going one way consistently. But uh, but it's always very close. Um, And so, you know, we continue to work with both sides of the aisle on the fact that we've got to be focused on doing right by public schools. 2.8 2.8 million children in the state of Florida attend public schools. Even with this being a very uh, voucher-friendly state, charter school-friendly state, the overwhelming super majority of parents keep their kids in the public schools. And what this pandemic has shown, and you've seen it from the governor and the commissioner, who are not necessarily pro-public education folks, have said that the public schools are vital, that kids learn best there, that we serve uh, the social and emotional needs of kids, that we connect the community, and that we are a foundation for the economy. Hmm. So public schools are vital. And this notion of continuing to try and undermine our public schools, even in what they've called the year of the teacher, uh, this this clearly goes against what we should be doing. Right? They've we, called it the year of the teacher. They they call this the year of the teacher. Yes, and so it's kind of ironic that in the year of the teacher, the commissioner of education said we should fire teachers. Oh uh, but God! We have a massive teacher shortage in the state of Florida. We have a massive bus driver shortage and paraprofessional store shortage and cafeteria worker shortage in the state, um, and, and they're not doing things to really help that. So for us, we've got to focus on what's happening in the schools and supporting our public schools. And that's what parents want, right? When we talk to parents, they want people to support their community public schools. They want lawmakers to invest in their kids. They want their kids to have opportunity. I don't care what socioeconomic status you come from, you want your kids 
to succeed and you want them to have a fair shot at it. And that's what we advocate for every day. Yeah, you certainly do. The Florida Education Association is an awesome organization I've worked with many times, and they're really lucky to have you, Andrew, and Fed and everybody uh, that is running and leading that organization because uh, of this major, major triumph in court for teachers, educators, students, as you said, bus drivers, and just the community, the people of Florida. Congratulations. And as always, I really appreciate you talking to me. Keep up the good work, pal. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate everything you do as well. Andrew Spar, Florida Educators Association, a great guy. Florida Education Association. Why do I constantly get it wrong? FEA, follow them on Twitter. Follow American Federation of Teachers as well. Support public education and the educators and administrators who are involved. I mean, I don't know. How are you doing with your school? My wife and I are on a bit different pages in terms of seeing what the issue is. To be fair, she's paying closer attention, has better sources than I do. Honestly, I'm not being magnanimous. I, I uh, She's been talking to some teachers and other people, but I try to give the benefit of the doubt to the administrators. Uh, the administrators, who the hell says it like that? <laughs> to the administrators, the administration, the superintendent, that they're doing all they can, but... The criticism is that they haven't been, that they dragged their feet, that they weren't ready because now our daughters are going just two days a week. I mean, not two days a week. They're going totally remotely at first. And at first they were going two days a week. Then they decided, now nah, we're not ready. And now they're going exclusively remotely on Zoom all day, I guess. And it starts next week. Our daughter's school starts next Wednesday or Thursday. So I'd love to hear... The situation at your kid's school, if you have school age kids, what is their situation? Email me, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And in the subject, write kids school. How about that? School time. Uh, back to school. Yeah, right. Back to school. Tell me where you live and what your school is doing. And I'll read them on the air. Email me, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Subject. Back to school. Thanks for your help working that out. All right. Now my second guest for today's show is my friend Jeff Jarvis. I love me some Jeff Jarvis. He is a professor at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism. He's the author of Geeks Bearing Gifts, Imagining New Futures for News. He is a journalism critic. He is a journalist. Uh, He is the author of, I should say, several books, honestly. Ah! I just got a mosquito, or did I? Motherfucker! How are they getting in here? The one main issue I'm seeing with the new Shedio is right next to the woods. A lot of bugs in here, but I haven't seen a mosquito in here. That wasn't just for show. That actually just happened. Sorry about that. Anyway, I was introducing Jeff Jarvis. Uh, He has advised media companies, startups, foundations. He's a public speaker. He was president and creative director of Advance.net. Uh, the online arm of advanced publications. He also was the founding editor of Entertainment Weekly magazine. He was a Sunday editor and associate publisher of the New York Daily News, TV critic for TV Guide People. He is a columnist for San Francisco Examiner and so many more credits. I love Jeff Jarvis. Go to buzzmachine.com, read him on Medium. Here is our conversation right now. Follow him on Twitter, by the way, at Jeff Jarvis. And he joins me now. There he is in his awesome home situation. I'm now in my home studio. Are you impressed with my new home studio, Jeff Jarvis? The the he shed, the Pete he shed is very impressive. Yes. No, I think, I think room Raider, I say this from someone who has a 10 on 10 rating. You got a what? I, well, to be fair, Yours was more grassroots, I would imagine. You you were just on TV and they rated it. I trolled the people at Room Raider and still only, I think, got an 8 out of 10. Uh, I had friends troll, but I got a 10, I'm proud to say. But, <laughs> so I think, I think as I'm looking, the pink light I'm getting is interesting. There. That's, that's very nice. Getting there. Um, but you need a tall plant. I don't know, like a three-foot tall plant. What kind of plant could that be, Pete? Oh, I'll put a, you know what? I have a perfectly sized uh, cannabis plant. Ah, perfect. Or 10. Whichever Perfect. of the 10 fits in here the best, I think, is the one I'll get. 
Yeah, I think I think you need a little. That's that. a great I'm idea. Perfect. I'm gonna name but, it. Do you mind if I name it after you? The Jeff I'd, Jarvis I'd cannabis honored. plant. I'd be <laughs> I'll get it. In, I'll get it in here. As <laughs> is the he shed all done now? Yeah, it's well. You know, I gotta make. I, I'm still doing a set decoration. I'm gonna uh, redo. I'm gonna do the walls up real nice and some some wood, yeah. some rustic looking wood. I think, and then I'm gonna do a cool lighting scheme and and make it all look a lot better than it does. How it's, do you? It, it's it's impressive because it before to be honest, I never said this to you, but it looked like you were kind of being held hostage. Yeah, yeah, that's and, that's and, true. And this is good. This is well, good. I was being held hostage by the fact that there was no ventilation in the yeah. old studio. I was being held hostage by by heat. That was enveloping me during every interview, and it was brutal. I was like sweating during interviews. Were you in the garage? Yes, I had a, a yes with no windows in this little tiny box, and this isn't that much bigger, but it's out in my yard. So I'm looking out at the birds in my garden. It's got AC, and and it will have heat. I hope. <laughs> no toilet though. No toilet, but yeah, I mean, no. I just, I just, peek, I, I peek it right out there, and I just open the door and I lean out for number ones. I don't want to know. Well, um, that's the sustainable thing to do. Yeah, yeah. lots to talk about uh, with Jeff Jarvis, as there always is. But maybe we start with the fact that the uh, the well, the DNC was last week. I haven't talked to you. How do you how do you think the Democrats pulled off a virtual I, convention, Jarvis? I think brilliantly, and 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 I wrote a little post about this. I think at uh, Buzz Machine. Things. At Buzz Machine and Medium, um, where I think it was the first um, YouTube convention, and and I, and I realized this the first night watching the former first lady, uh, where YouTube is intimate, right? You click on someone's face and they talk to you one on one, right there, right? There's no cheering crowds, there's no no huge rooms of of states and roll calls. It was just her talking to us. And and I think it was amazing, and I think that that's what the the current age demands. And so and so the idea of the huge screaming throng, which which Donald Trump so depends upon for his fragile ego, um, is over. It's gone. And there's another post I haven't put up yet. I'm thinking about is I'm also thinking about the kind of the the end of applause. When you think about it, applause is really stupid. I'm going to hit myself to show approval, right? And and I watched. The convention where there's no applause, and then I watched uh, Sarah Cooper doing Jimmy Kimmel's show and the and the, and the, um, the monologue, and I was struck by her courage. You you must I really want to hear your, you about this because here's a comedian. I mean, yeah, you do radio all the time, and you don't have an audience yeah. to hear you. But if you do a straight up monologue, you do a routine, and there is zero feedback. It struck me as really courageous and really difficult. And um, I mean, I think is courageous is, is a word that should be reserved oh, oh, for. Oh, all right. All right. I think um, it's a little much, but but a little yes, gutsy, a little gutsy. It is very hard to perform comedy without people there to laugh because the right. timing and it just it's cringy to even listen to as a viewer, because that's just not how comedy but, works. But I don't think so anymore. I think I think what, what the Democratic Convention showed is we've gone past the idea of applause and the big room and cheers and lock her up and all of that. And, and it's a different age. So I think the Democrats were extremely successful. I thought you. Yeah. I, I thought it was absolutely. I thought it was great because yeah. it was a big TV show and they brought in TV actors and they had TV producers I think that knew a lot about television and that medium. They knew that they were on television. I, whereas I don't know as much with the RNC that they, that they felt that way. Certainly Kimberly uh, Guy Foyle and, and, and what? even and what others, are you saying? they were in these giant, they were in a giant <laughs> space. I guess they were at the DNC too, but it just didn't it, it, so far. We've only had one night. Well, the well, DNC knew that they were, I, I, I disagree to this extent. I don't think it was a TV convention. Again, I think it was a YouTube convention. I think they realized that a lot of people were going to stream them, that it was different. It was intimate. Better point. It was not, yeah. it was not. And what did it play to before? The old conventions played to a bunch of hacks in a hall. And now it played to the citizens. That was the difference. And it, yeah, yes, perfectly said it. And I, I think my view on conventions is skewed because since I started talking and covering politics, I was at all of those conventions, Jeff. I was at the 2012 and the 2016 conventions, both the RNC and the DNC. I was at some of the debates as well. And so I always remember 
asking people, how did that play at home? Because here in the room, when Clint Eastwood came out with, with the chair, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was a much different experience than those yeah. watching at home. We were all confused. And turns out everybody was, but including Clint Eastwood and Mitt Romney. But I think that the way that it was done, I mean, obviously the roll call was a, was a brilliant move. And yep. um, so all in all, I thought it w- it went off really well. And I thought that we could talk about everybody's speeches, but I thought the most important speech came from the nominee, Joe Biden. And I thought he nailed it. I thought he and delivered it very, it, very well. Brilliantly too. Yep. And then it showed a magnificent cr- contrast to this week. Well, we're only one day in um, to this oh, week, but it's already we, we know what we need to know. Set the tone to a certain extent, um, and it would seem that what they are trying to do is what they've always tried to do, including at the last at the 2016 convention or 15 convention, really, uh, and at the inauguration, Jeff, which is to scare Americans as much as they can into voting for them. I don't know if I've said this before in conversation with you, but it it struck me again last night how much this is the last stand of the old white man. And I, and I say that as an old white man, uh, it is people who are frightened, who know, it's not just frightened. They know they are going to lose their position. They know they don't deserve it. They know they don't have it by merit. They know that it's gone. And so what they're doing is burning the fields. We are not going to share the corn with these people of color who are coming up behind us. It was ours. It's not going to be ours anymore. Okay, we're going to burn it down. We're going to destroy the courts and Congress and the post office, for God's sakes, and every American institution that has any value because we're not going to share it. And we're going to have one last big burst of white anger. And that's all it was, was white anger. We're going to abolish the suburbs. By the way, Pete, you and I, we got to pack up tonight because I think the, the suburbs Joe are Joe Biden gone. is going to come through your neighborhood and he's going to shoot a COVID gun on your lawn. And then when he's out of the virus, he is going to shoot actual black families uh, onto your lawn and they're going to live there with you. Would so not the suburbs be- are over. The cities are hellscapes. We can't go there. I don't know where we can go, Pete. I don't know where. Uh, because America Church. is a hellscape. There's a lot of talk of church. That's where we get COVID. That's a good point. I do want to stay with that, though, for uh, another reason, though. You know, listening to to Donald Trump Jr., much less Donald Trump, talk about religion, their own religiosity, attending church as an important place to be. And then seeing this whole Jerry Falwell scandal unfold, (laughs) you're reminded that the people who talk most about church are generally the worst people who care the least about church and only want to use it as a grift. So I, you may have talked about this in the air. I just missed it when you have. Were you raised in religion? Yeah, well, I was conf- baptized, First Communion, confirmation, left the church. Parents didn't care, never cared, only did it for Italian grandma. When she was gone, it was gone. So Craig Catholic. Yeah, I but I don't raised, even like to say raised Catholic because there was just none of the shrug, tenets. I did go to shrug. religious education, and we yeah. went to church when there was no snow on the ground that we could skip to ski. Right. I mean, I can't imagine. So my, my sister, it so happens, is a, is a Presbyterian minister, mm-hmm. a good scotch-drinking liberal Presbyterian minister. And uh, the mainline church is completely abandoned and ignored now, and the idea of church is taken over by the Jerry Falwells of the world. And and it's got it's shameful. It's just it's just ridiculous. So yeah, what but, was your what was your uh, worst moment for the country last night in the first night of the Republican convention? I, I I really struggled when black people came out and and talked about Donald Trump and testified to his character. Tim Scott, Herschel Walker, and then I think there was one other guy who I, I'm forgetting who he was. Um, those people troubled me so much as you know you and i are both very focused on racial injustice in this country do everything that we can uh to try to fight that and so to see black folks go up there and tout donald trump's uh, initiatives and character was really that 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 bothered me because i felt like they it, they didn't necessarily know better they they kind of believe what they said herschel walker especially. And 
I it just made me very sad and and Tim angry. Scott saying tonight, uh, saying last night that he was uh, that, that he went from cotton to Congress in a generation. And Al Sharpton today to Nicole Wallace was brilliant about this, saying, "You didn't do this on your own. The RNC certainly didn't do this. People like me, Al Sharpton, that is, fought for you, and you didn't acknowledge that at all. And 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 that notion of cotton to Congress." was offensive uh, because they tried to give the Republicans credit for something that they fought. Well, right. And the thing that a lot of f- people don't know, if you're not paying close attention to politics, uh, certainly during the Obama administration, you might not know this, is that when President Trump passed the initiatives that he did pass that helped black folks, specifically funding for historically black colleges, universities and the Opportunity Zones and uh, most, I think, uh, the thing that people most talk about is this idea of criminal justice reform. It's not as if Barack Obama and Democrats didn't try to pass those types of initiatives and programs specifically and especially criminal justice reform. It's that when Barack Obama was president, when the black guy was president, they, the white Senate, Mitch McConnell and the House would not let him even vote on such initiatives, much less pass them. It wasn't if they didn't try. They tried. Republicans wouldn't let him. When Donald Trump came in, the white supremacist, and gave these little crumbs out, they passed them and made him look like he cares. But just the context and history on that matters. So that really bothered me. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think to me, there were a lot of low moments. Yeah. What, McCloskey's, what were you? McCloskey's, the, the gun Oof, couple. That, that was low. The uh, Parkland dad, I saw that. That was, that was heart-wrenching low. listening to him talk about his daughter and then giving Donald Trump credit. Um, the McCloskey's the though, what, how did, what, that, what a weird invitation they got, huh? Well, to say it's a great country cause we can own guns, that that's how you define greatness is we can own guns and threaten people with them. People we, we are scared of. Yeah. Um, uh, again, last stand of the old white man and woman, uh, they know what's coming they know they're going to lose it. Uh, and they think that they're somehow protecting their fortress. And then, nothing, nothing, Pete, nothing could top Kimberly Gilfoyle. Yeah. Yeah. That was just wacky. The former wife of Gavin Newsom is now the Which governor of California. Everybody's being reminded of right now and is shocked about. I actually met her yeah. in Davos. How's that? Oh, huh? look at you. With, with Gavin years back. Oy. And, um, and no, well, no, I just, I was, everybody was drunk. It was late. Uh, <laughs> did she scream um, at you? No, no, she didn't. Um, you know, it's kind of, it strikes me that she's the antimatter to Ariana Huffington's matter, right? <laughs> Ariana was married to a Republican, became Democrat. Yeah. Kimberly was married to a Democrat, became Got Republican. It. Yeah. Um, Interesting. But she was, she was truly frightening. I mean, Donald Trump Jr. is more frightening. The two of them together is 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 something I cannot even imagine. Were they and maybe this is sexist, but were they were they comparing her to kind of like Disney villains? Because that's what she reminded me of. And the way that she Ooh. talked and the way that she looked, it was just so Corella Deville. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um and it, it, I mean, again, who was she screaming at talking about knowing the space that you're in? She didn't seem to care at all. She was screaming at no one. Uh, she thought that she was going to be, uh, I guess this is, this is that she was supposed to imagine it was a hall of screaming people and joy. Yeah. But, but yeah, well, she, she, I'll give her credit. She was certainly committed. What about junior? I stopped watching oh. and I was looking at Twitter that couldn't take it anymore. And everybody was talking about Donald Trump Jr.'s eyes. So I was like, ah, screw it. I turned it back on. And sure enough, uh, there was something going on. There was something not happening. You were, not that you're an expert in these things, my friend. No. What combination of drug cocktail could you imagine could make those eyes? I would think it'd be a Ridlin cocaine mix, but <laughs> yeah. I can't be sure, and I don't want to cast aspersions no, no. on a man with such a character. Distance. Well, the thing that bothers me most about Donald Trump Jr. or people who are born into privilege in general is when, A, they don't realize it, but even worse, they disparage those who have actually accomplished something in, in their life. And I forget the line, but there was something that he said about Joe Biden. This is just so horrible and terrible about Joe Biden. I'm like, you killed a lion and an elephant or some shit. Like you, you are a, and have always been 
a shitty person who's contributed nothing good to the world. And and you're disparaging Joe Biden, who say whatever you want. He has contributed quite a bit of good to the world over his career in many different ways. And that that really bothers me when people do that. I mean, the worst thing we could do is try to normalize this and say, well, it didn't act like a normal convention. And I hate that kind of stuff. Yeah. I saw people trying to do it on Twitter. But still, I'm trying to understand the logic of the Republican convention. Right. It's it's they're not in any way actually selling Donald Trump. All they're doing is saying that uh, Joe Biden is uh, building a socialist utopia, which, by the way, sounds very nice to me. I, I'd be I'd be quite happy with the socialist utopia right now. Well, they certainly did use that word a lot. Well, Almost did. everybody they used did. that word, and they 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 they, well, they use it in such a me. frightening way. Uh, was uh, I tweeted this this morning? I hope the signatories to the Harper's letter are proud that they gave the Republicans the closest thing they have to a platform in whining about cancel culture. I mean, how, how ridiculous. Why? What did, what, what did you hear because, last because night? They, that they, seemed... were, they, were, they were all going on about, it's, it's, it's the martyr complex of the cult, right? So we are, we are put upon, uh, even though that we own the entire damn government right now, yeah. and we can do anything we damn well please. And lots of media. Go, go over all law. Um, we're going to have to act like martyrs. And so martyrs in what way, pray tell? Oh, because they're trying to cancel us. Um, it's ridiculous, and it's and it's the the apparent progressives who signed the Harper's letter yeah. who all played right into the hands of the yeah. far right. I, I I hear about it almost every day, Jeff. The 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 call, uh, cancel culture conversation, and in a lot of interviews I do, and I'm a guest, I'm asked about it, and I I don't think about that as an issue plaguing America. I don't. I'm not. I'm not concerned about it in any way. There are certain people that I feel like have been maybe too heavily criticized or should be given a, a second chance, but I'm not, I'm not that worried about them and it's no. very rare and I don't think it's an epidemic and I don't want to talk about it and I'm not worried about it. And why am I not, why am I not worried about it? Maybe because I'm not being an asshole. I don't know. So there was a, I, I'm forgetting her name suddenly. There's a Canadian academic who talked about it. And if we talked about this in a prior show, stop me. Um, but she said, what's really happening here is we're renegotiating our norms of society and the people want to add things to the list of things we shouldn't say. Yes. Right. When I was young, men would call women girls. You do not do that. Now we added that to the list of things we shouldn't say. Right. And so there's people want to add things to that list. And then there is what she called the status quo warriors. And the status quo warriors are those people who have the microphones, who have the power, who have the privilege, who don't like being criticized. And those are the folks who signed the Harper's letter. Uh, that's from the kind of quasi-academic world. Uh, don't shut me up on campus. But the exact same line is being used by the right wing. And so what's happening on, on, on social media is that we say, damn it, Facebook, take down this crap. And Facebook says, finally, okay, we'll take that down. And then the right says, hey, that was my crap. You canceled me. Right. And so... All we're really doing is renegotiating our norms in what we've considered to be acceptable in society. Well, yeah, I like the way that you said that renegotiating our norms. Uh, Kamala Harris in an interview a couple of days ago was asked something about what do you want your supporters or the American people uh, to know uh, about your campaign or what, you, what you're trying to do? And she had the perfect answer. It was simple, but I thought it was perfect. And it was, we see you. And when you say renegotiating the norms and, and now instead of calling uh, women girls, we call them women. What I hear is people complaining, why, why do we have to change the way that we talk? In this case, changing it from girls to women. And I think of Kamala Harris's answer, and I'm going to be using this a lot more, which is because people want to be seen for what they are, for who yes. they are, for, yes. for, for the category that they belong to, especially for immutable characteristics, for their accomplishments. They just want to be seen. And when you minimize them or when you don't equalize them to who you are and what you are, they're not seen. They're 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 minimized, which goes back to the other the other trope, of course, is identity. And people um, make fun of of that idea. But I but, it, but it's not to be made fun of because what we've done for so long in media, in marketing, in business, in government, in polling is to uh, identify people by external definitions, 
This is what we think you are. This is the demographic we give you and so on. When instead, people have a right to identify themselves the way they want to. And I, and I think that we were in a binary society where you were red or blue or 99% or 1% and so on and so forth. Uh, black and white, obviously. And now you can be 80 different shades of gender and sexual identity. And who's to say that you shouldn't be? And if, if, if I'm going to criticize you for not recognizing me for who I say I am, then yeah, I have a right to. And yeah, I will cancel you for that moment uh, because I'll make you see me as who I am. So well said. Yes, you just explained it perfectly. The evolution of the idea and, and, and that people just want to be referred to as to how they identify. Why, why, is, that, why is that such a burden? Because I think when people, when although people, I have had, tr I have had trouble referring um, to trans people as they, because it seems like a plural. And I want to say, and I've said this before, I'm like, I, I'll call you whatever you want, no matter what. I'm just saying, can it be a singular, a word that refers to the singular? Because I can't remember to call a person they. And let me get a cup for my tears because I can't remember. But I, I do want I do it's, want to admit that's the one I've struggled with. Well, just because it's I'm old and it's hard to break habits. Yeah. Um, in German, they put an asterisk in the middle of words around the gender. In Spanish, they fight around the gender of words. It's harder in gendered languages than it even is in ours. Uh, but they is hard for singular to plural. I, I, I try it. I do it. I need to do it. I must do it. It's the right thing to do. It's just I forget that I feel like an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you're being disrespectful. Like, no, I'm sorry. I just I looked at you and saw that you were one person. And I so let me ask you uh, another a question about a, a current event that's happened. And, and we've seen this before in the Trump administration. Uh, but this this time is it's the FDA. Well, you'll remember back a few weeks uh, during the protests in uh, Lafayette uh, Park when the president t uh, uh, tear gassed the peaceful protesters so he could go have a photo op, that he was accompanied by a number of folks in the administration, including uh, the chief of staff, Millie, who was in his fatigues. And he later apologized for accompanying the president. This is what we're seeing again. We've seen this kind of thing over and over where someone makes a display, a gesture because he's being, he usually uh, influenced, forced into it by the administration, which is basically Donald Trump, and then later walks it back. Most recently, it's Stephen Hahn, who today uh, responded to a very uh, angry outcry from medical export experts. ABC News reports that the FDA administration commissioner, Stephen Hahn, Tuesday apologized for overstating the life saving benefits of treating COVID 19 patients with convalescent plasma. This or, is a, or as the president would say, plasma. Ugh. Why is this story so important? Because the, the head of the federal, the, 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 the agency that's supposed to protect our lives uh, played along with Trump and lied to us. He should resign from his job. He should lose his medical license. Um, I've mentioned this to you before. I, I, I have a Twitter COVID list. Love it. If you go to bit.ly slash COVID Twitter list, you'll find it. And in, in the middle of Sunday of Trump and Han being on the stage saying, I've, I've all but cured it with plasma. <clears throat> I went to my COVID Twitter list and the scientists, the doctors, the people who know were going batshit as well. They should. Big, big. And, and they knew, they said immediately how irresponsible this is, how, how, it's, how it misrepresents the fact that we do not have good data, how by saying this out loud now and doing this, we're never going to get good data to find out whether the plasma actually does any good or not, how it, it horrendously hurts science and health. And this is the head of the FDA playing along. And then the next day he gets smashed by his colleagues and wants to back up and say, oh, oops, I kind of overspoke. No, it's not good enough. You should lose your damn job. Well, you won't. the the reason why that's important, my understanding is because when you go out and you tout a drug that's unproven, that's in a trial, it's in phases, it, it ruins the research, the testing. Uh, this happened with uh, hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine and it's happening now 
uh, with what uh, the, the the plasma situation, because the, the the way that you conduct randomized controlled studies is you can't have people know whether or not they're getting the drug or, or the placebo. But when you're out there publicizing something, it throws off the trials because people want the drug and not the placebo. And that destroys the way that research is done, which is why you don't have people in government or anywhere else doing this kind of a thing, because scientists are saying you're making our job well, impossible. And further, they touted a 35 percent uh, decrease in death. There was no justification for that whatsoever. They do not have the data for that. It was made up. They were lying to the American public. Now, the fear, of course, is that, you know, the first their first sin was hydroxychloroquine. The next sin was blood plasma. The next sin that's going to be the most dangerous is that before the election, I guarantee you we're going to see a picture of Trump getting a vaccine, an unproven, untested yeah. Yeah. vaccine, probably from Putin. I, I swear it'll be Putin's vaccine. Hopefully it's the vaccine Vlad. that Putin gave his opposition, uh, Ooh, Navalny. That. Take a little tea. Um, and so we have, a, we have an atmosphere where people don't trust vaccines. And when an unproven, yeah. untested, and dangerous vaccine gets given to people and, in fact, makes them sick and doesn't work, then people are going to trust vaccines even less because these bozos had an impact on science. Call me a naive, ignorant little prick. You don't have to add little prick. No, I think I that would, I think I that would be unfair. I won't. Okay. I won't. But I have a hard time believing, and I think I, I, I believe I read a quote from whoever's job it is in government, I think at the FDA, who would have to sign off on such a vaccine, that he or she would do that for Donald Trump, for anybody. When you sign off on a drug, that is not proven effective. You are potentially in a vaccine, especially you are potentially uh, killing, if not it, 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 making people very, very sick, hundreds, if not thousands or millions. I, I just am I naive to think that some, no one's going to sign off on that for Trump or for anybody if it is not proven to work. Let me ask you a question. I so the worst day for me in this entire pandemic was the day when the death toll passed that of 9-11. Mm. I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. I still, I was actually diagnosed at Bellevue with PTSD out of 9-11. It's still, every anniversary matters. It's a, it's a solemn uh, moment for me. And it passed 3,000. And I thought, my Lord. And now we are how many 9-11s in? And the country seems um, numb, uh, blind, deaf, mute to the volume of tragedy here, to the, to the blood that is on the hands of this administration, to the, to the murder, the, the senseless death, the needless death that has occurred. I, 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 that's, I, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think people are fully grokking it. Why is that? Because it's mainly old people and black people and Latino people uh, because it's just too much to bear. Um, why is it the same as, what we see today um, with Jacob Blake and yet another um, police-involved shooting, as we all horribly say, is it because of the mass shootings? Uh, have we just lost our humanity as a nation? What's going on? Yeah, I think I think to a certain extent, certain sectors <clears throat> of our society have have lost humanity, especially if, <clears throat> excuse me, if they are not affected by the issue that we're talking about. I mean, even white liberals didn't care as much about black lives matter until that was, they were forced to see these videos of people being killed in, in, in the streets, I think. And I think in this new poll of Republicans, they were asked, you know, uh, about all of the death. And they said, basically it's uh, what was the phrase acceptable. acceptable. Yeah, it was acceptable. And I, and I think that it's not as much their people um, or it's people who are unhealthy or more likely to get sick and die, or it's older folks. And the vast majority of people are not older uh, that are necessarily voting or answering these polls. So, yeah, it's it doesn't touch them as intimately. But I don't know. I'd be interested in seeing a poll of families who have lost someone close to them on how they feel about it, because everybody I know who has lost someone close to them is looking for someone to blame. And as you saw in the DNC, this one woman blamed Donald Trump square on his name and said he died because he believed Donald Trump. Or she said that, I think, about her dad, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Um, different topic. Let me ask you a question. The question I wanted to see Joe Biden asked is how would you limit the power of the presidency uh, given the abuse that we have seen with it? Or another way to put it is what's the list of things you have to fix that Donald Trump broke, right? How do we, if, if, if God, I'm, I'm knocking wood right now, if, if God help us, we end up with a Trump um, defeat and Biden in the presidency. If God help us, we can even take over the Senate. Um, where do you start? Uh, what it's do you a great, qu- it's a great, great question. And I doubt he'll be asked that at any point. I doubt he'll be asked that at any point because it's such a good no. question. But I mean, you think back to Obama and some of the executive orders that he passed because Republicans in Congress would do nothing. They just wouldn't. And, and so he went this constitutional scholar and did some questionable constitutional things, I think, on DACA and a couple of other things with executive orders and kind of opened the door to that. Some people say, but obviously Donald Trump has blown the the entire door off the House and uh, is, is doing everything that way. But I think it's a question it's a constitutional balance question of between the executive and the legislative branch. Like if the le- if if Congress, Jeff Jarvis, can't pass anything. Should the president go it alone? So that's that's the question, right? Should the presidency be limited given how it has been turned into an authoritarian institution? Yeah. Yeah. Or does that give up uh, the leverage we have if we end up with another Congress, Senate, most likely, that, that won't do anything? Yeah, that's a major concern. Maybe he could, uh, maybe Joe Biden, if he wins, uh, could bring in an attorney general who writes a paper about limiting presidential authority as opposed to wouldn't that be interesting? Giving it all away. What do you think about you? You, of course, uh, are a professor journalism. You teach at a great school in New York City uh, and everybody should what go there, support the it. Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, we have degrees in journalism, social journalism and uh, news innovation and leadership. Yes, come. But go ahead. Thank y- you you are an extremely innovative school and person constantly looking for new ideas and ways to adapt. But how are you doing at going back to school? How are you innovating and adapting to that with your students? And what do you think about what's happening in our schools here in, in the U.S.? I mean, our, our, our K through 12 colleges and, of course, uh, the, your school. I, I thank goodness my kids are grown, so I don't have to deal with that. I don't, I don't know how I would deal with that at that level. Um, I worry about undergrad. University of Alabama today said they've had 500 cases. They've been back a few weeks. I'm very lucky to be at CUNY where they have some good sense, but we do out of, out of pain. We've had more than 40 faculty members at CUNY alone die from COVID. Oh, wow. And yeah. that's, but that's, um, the, not, that's, that's the, the whole, whole system. That's the whole of CUNY. That's the whole of CUNY. Uh, which is a giant institution, but still. Um, so we are not in session. A few classes across the entirety of CUNY, if they absolutely must be there under certain circumstances, maybe, but my, all my stuff's off, uh, online. So um, I've already taught my first class because we have, or, I, in orientation, I get to hypnotize uh, the entire incoming class. I, I have YouTube videos up uh, that I had to do on uh, the history of journalism, the business of journalism. Normally that's a discussion. But because of this, I had to uh, make videos and turn them into lectures. So it was a whole big thing. It took a lot of time, a lot of effort. I did that. So then I had 100 students in one Zoom call for three one-hour discussions. That was pretty hard. Uh, it was really difficult. And then we had a three-hour session with the students in one Zoom call where they were going to break up into sessions and, and, and do an exercise. Zoom borked us. Zoom wouldn't break, break us up into groups. It sent people, students into, into one room alone and brought them back like four times. Ugh. So I had to do what was intended as a small group exercise with 100 students. What I love about the students we have right now um, is that they chose to be here now. You know, I, I made a short five-minute video welcoming them, and I said that I... I, I admired their courage. I'm going to use courage this time and mean it, that they chose to come to a journalism school right now. And I, and I told some students who were debating whether to delay, if they waited a year, they'd kick themselves. The two biggest stories of my lifetime 
a, a racial reformation of America and a, un, an almost unprecedented pandemic are going on right now. And I think that in a journalism school, they kick themselves if they weren't trying to learn under those circumstances. And they're gonna learn all kinds of resilient ways to report that weren't possible before. So I love the incoming class. I really do love the incoming class because they chose this challenge. And yeah, we screwed up on Zoom. And yeah, I had to force them to watch, you know, Jarvis blathering on for 45 minutes about the history of journalism, which all of you can watch on YouTube if you'd like. Um, uh, but they, they rolled with the punches. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And I think that in some ways, not 100 students at once in, in the Zoom is impossible. But when we get down to 15, 16 students, I think Zoom may allow better conversation in some ways. I think we can get guests from elsewhere. Yeah. I think we can do all kinds yeah. of new things. And by the way, we just announced today, and I want to get you involved in this, we announced today a new version of our entrepreneurial journalism program. I started this when we started the school. That was more about, hey, kids, let's start a business. And now it's different. Now it's about the independent, resilient journalist, the individual who wants to serve people, serve a community through podcasts and YouTube and Patreon and so on and raise money through those ways. So we started that program and there's 100 days online only to learn how to do that. I'm also starting a community of practice. I was going to. I love you that uh, idea, the entrepreneurial journalism program. You can look at Jeff's Twitter at Jeff Jarvis for more on that. I saw that when I was preparing to talk to you, and thought it was it, it sounds great. Go ahead. What was the other thing? So the other thing I'm, I'm, we're starting is a community of practice, uh, where we want to take exemplars of this idea of the independent media person, and I want you to be part of that. Uh oh. Because I think I think you had to switch from being wage slave. Mm -hmm. to independent person virtually overnight. Yeah. Um, you know all the difficulty of that and all the pain and struggle of that, but you also know the freedom and benefit of that now that you're in your he shed. I think a key element here is if you're lucky to have your own he shed. They shed. Yes. Um, or they shed, yes. Uh, and um, so I want to provide examples for these students to say, you too can be Pete. Yeah. You know, I, and I would love to do anything like that and be a part of it. And it's been a phenomenal, crazy, terrifying journey for me here. But I always do feel a little bit uh, weird about it because I started my career basically, well, as a comedian, then adapted into corporate media, basically, all types, TV and radio, and now as an independent person. But I created the base with somebody else's platform, in this case, Sirius XM, which gave me a huge audience, you know, thanks to Howard and, and other people. So I had this base to start with. And you so tried. I always I, I always struggle to try to tell people how to start such a project. So if, how, do you, how do you think do you, if, if you were um, 20 years younger, Pete, right now, and you still had hair and your beard wasn't gray, yeah. and you didn't have hair in your ears and all of that. Um <laughs> Do you think you could build it from scratch or, or, or I don't I mean, know. How, I, Howard argues, no, you've got to build radio uh, uh, with radio. Um, well, I, I mean, he's a little old now at this point and he's, yes. he's not, he's not admitting what I'm admitting to some extent, which is he went to serious. He, he started the most, you know, traditional route into radio. Basically he was smart enough to go from a kind of a music DJ to a commentator and create something that really what didn't exist. So it never take anything away from him, but the idea that somebody else is going to do what he did makes no sense because of YouTube and, and podcast because yeah. all that's gone. But I, I don't, I don't know exactly what I would say. I think that the best thing you can do, I would tell any young person is to get on somebody else's ship and see how they're doing it and what they're doing. But you can't just throw it's It's hard to just put a camera on and build an audience. Although people do do it. People I mean, my it, daughters are watching, you know, teenagers that have millions of viewers and the, and the channel that they're watching, the person that they're watching is the most talentless. Uh, it, every time I see my daughter watching You're it, just I, an old fart. You're uh, yeah. just an old fart. You know, I went to uh, did you, have your daughters talk to you about VidCon. I've heard about it. Yeah, you say that with the with the get off my lawn. No, not at all. It's it, no. I'd love to go to it. No, it's fine. I've, it's actually superb. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's my favorite like a nerd fest for you, YouTubers well, and stuff, it's, right? It's young people. I mean, I went there the first time and and I didn't know what I was walking into, and that was in the the Marriott Hotel, surrounded by a thousand young screaming women, uh, girls 
uh, and people I'd never heard of whom they were fans. They're like, look, it's Colonel Sanders. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's it's amazing to watch the different relationship that is, that's built there and, yeah. and, and how people do that. And I learned a lot about a different view of community, a different view of, 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 of having your public. So I, I think young Pete Dominic, even without Sirius in your background and even without all that background, I think you could build something. It's harder. It's riskier. I think you could. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've got to work really hard, know what you're doing, learn how to talk to a camera and microphone, learn how to edit that, learn how to light it. it things don't. I think sometimes people go too far with some of the technical things, but it does have to be audible and 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 enjoyable. I mean, a lot of the things that that I think young people are watching that are very popular are heavily edited, and I don't think most people know how much time editing takes and you can't necessarily hire do someone uh, to do that for you at the beginning. So I think that that's a, a very under covered uh, skill is just kind of editing things together and knowing how to put graphics up and, and all those things. But I always say, you know, I was, I've never been the most talented one on the team, but I always worked the hardest. I, tr- I did my best to learn the skills. I mean, I'm in the shed and I had to learn carpentry and drywall and insulation from a guy who helped me, of course, but I, cause I wanted to do it myself. I, I do you to, ever see having uh, Pete Dominic, the network? Do you see developing? I other do. Talent? I, I do. Yeah. Because I've done that my whole life, my whole mm-hmm. career. I, I helped a lot of people develop a lot of people, but I didn't ever do it to, to, to benefit me as kind of a network. I sometimes, I like to limit my ambition because I think I don't want to go too far with my work. I love what I do, but there's a there's a set point where I I have time to take care of my mental health and my family and my garden. And when you're one of these people who is constantly creating and creating other opportunities, I, I get worried about getting stuck in that in that cycle of career ambition and, and, and losing focus about my ambition to be a healthy person in mind and body. But that long diatribe aside yeah, the Pete Dominic Network is something I think about from time to time. I mean, I did create it at SiriusXM. I created a channel in my image, which was comedians talking about, you know, it's the, the daily right. show for the radio. And, of course, SiriusXM greenlit it and then immediately destroyed it. Yeah, that's what corporations do. Yeah. But so that's, you're going to become a corporation yourself. Well, I would love – I mean, it's easier to build these these networks now, right, to mm-hmm. build a channel. Mm-hmm. And – I, I love developing other people and other other voices. Um, so you know, who knows? It's but it's definitely possible. And I would love to talk to some young people about what. The, I mean, everything is so niche now too that if you're very passionate or interested in this or that, you you can maybe create a channel where people will want to go listen to you talk about that thing. It's not so much niche as it is normal. Uh, what was abnormal was the idea of treating us all as a mass. That we're all one. Oh, group yeah. I like people. the way you we're flip all that. All the same. Right. right. Because because we had to, because you could only produce one channel, right. or one paper right. or one magazine. And it had to serve everybody. You had to market and convince everybody. It Sports, was just right real to estate, that. lifestyle, that entertainment. News. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, now we're, we're reverting to, I think, a more normal world. That's interesting. Yeah, that of course, you you frame it differently. One last question for you, which is about a journalism question. Uh, I saw your tweet about the Washington Post. Um, <laughs> and it's the Columbia Journalism Review has this uh, piece, which you're sharing. The Washington Post editorializes against dishonest ads. The ad team runs them. I love this kind of, uh, what would you call this? Uh, expose, if you will, because it's so important for people to understand kind of what's happening. And it also gives us an understanding of how big media corporations have to fund themselves. Uh, explain what is this piece is so about, went, why it matters. I went batshit last week when uh, on the first night of the, or in Kamala Harris's night of the Democratic Convention, uh, I turn on the Washington Post first thing in the morning, which is the first paper I now go to, because I think they're wonderful. And I see it, what we call a takeover ad. It, it, it completely subsumed the Washington Post. You saw a video of a Trump ad accusing um, Biden and Kamala Harris of being far left and taking over the country and all that stuff. And, and it was their dystopian ad. And I had a fit that the Washington Post did this. Now, some might say, no, Jeff, it's political advertising. Everybody has a fair shot. They want to buy the ad. They want to buy the ad. But it wasn't really an ad. 
it was Trump owning the libs. It was Trump using the Washington Post. It was the Washington Post being gamed. And um, I was offended by that. I thought it was wrong. I had a fit. I had arguments online about it. Um, and then Glenn Kessler, the, the major fact checker of the Washington Post, fact checked the Trump ad and said it was wrong. And so today, my friend Bill Gruskin at Columbia University wrote the piece you mentioned um, in the Columbia Journal's review saying that the Washington Post had editorialized saying to Facebook that they should fact check political ads and get rid of bad political ads. And ah, here, right. the ad side of the Washington Post took a Trump ad that fails a fact check. And it was hypocrisy. And that's what journalism feeds on is finding hypocrisy. But to find it in our own front yard is galling. Well, I don't know if this is the exact equivalent, but I also had a fit when I saw or heard this. I like this podcast of all the kind of corporate media podcasts. The um, ABC News does something called Start Here, and um, they, he does a, they they do a great job. The host is named Brad Milkey. He does a great job. And and the one thing I do like to say though is like. Um, I do a similar podcast every day. It's just me. He's got like 15 people helping him. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and I, I think about it every day. I'm like, that's, I can get any of those guests that he just had, including the senators and anybody else he has on, uh, I can get them and do a similar podcast. I don't necessarily have all the bells and whistles that they have, but you don't need them. Guess what? You don't need them. Um, but he does a segment. Now, this isn't, to be fair, the same episode, but he does a segment warning about some really serious issues with climate change. The next episode, and then episode subsequently, he, the host, Brad Milkey, does a live read for Shell. <laughs> and I don't know that that's exactly the same as what you're talking about uh, with Washington Post, but I did reach out to Emily Atkin, who's brilliant and uh, writes the Daily Newsletter Heated journalism on climate change. And she says, you're right to call it out. The explicit purpose of fossil fuel advertising is to buy social license to operate amid a climate crisis. There's no other reason. It's not like other advertising. It's not like selling another product. It sells an idea. The idea being, and she's right about this because this is how he does the live read. Fossil fuels are good. The sole purpose of that idea is to get the public to think shell is good, that it's on the side of public good and not straight up killing people through its refusal to become a renewable energy company. And she adds data. You can look up studies showing that companies like BP and Shell use advertising specifically as part of their strategy to oppose climate legislation, a.k.a. kill people. Advertising is not evil. I'm, I'm now reading. I'm, I'm so wonky. How wonky am I? I'm reading a book about the Dutch Republic and the birth of modern advertising in wow. the 1600s. How, how, how wonky wow. is that? That's, that's wonky. actually really important and interesting, the birth of advertising. That's wonky. Um, and, and this book actually argues with this point, but the argument is made, Alan Rusberger, the former editor of The Guardian, would argue that advertising saved journalism from ownership by political parties. And advertising gave us independence so that we, we didn't have to be owned by it. And, and what I tell my students all the time is that any source of revenue that you can possibly imagine brings conflict of interest. Anything. Subscription brings conflict of interest because you're going to suck up to your subscribers and you're not going to tell them bad stuff. Uh, foundations bring conflict of interest because they have their own agendas. Government, Lord knows, will bring conflict of interest because I don't want government to be involved in speech. Advertising brings, brings conflict of interest. They all bring conflict of interest. And we've all always got to deal with that. So you can have advertising on a site. You can do it in ways that are, are okay. Um, but you got to know where the lines are. When I started the magazine Entertainment Weekly many years ago, many, many years ago, 30 years ago now, oof, at Time Inc., a huge book landed on my desk with the rules of advertising. And a wise old sage, and there were many of them at Time Inc., walked in and said, I can, I, can, I can summarize that whole book in one sentence, Travis. The reader must never be confused about the source of content. The reader must know if there's a linkage there. And they, and they have to be able to judge you. And if ABC chooses to take uh, petroleum money, then the reader is free to judge them. And they've got to realize that, and they've got to run their business on that basis, and too often they don't. What do you think about the difference between rolling an ad into your show and voicing the ad and doing what's called a live read. Because I think that when, and I had serious issues with Sirius XM about this and that I wouldn't do those. 
uh, except for a few earlier in my career. And then they knew I wouldn't do them. And I'm sure that never, that didn't really help me uh, where everybody else does them. Uh -huh. But, but lending my voice is lending my credibility to the actual company as if I buy or use that product. In which case I felt like that, I, I could not do that, Jeff. I couldn't do it. This is the nature of what we now call native advertising. Right. And uh, what publications try to, or what advertisers try to do is to get the publication to put the ad in the flow uninterrupted. Right. Uh, but radio has always done that. Now, a time for mattresses. I'm telling you, I love this mattress. I sleep I, on it every let night. Let me be it's clear. I'll mattress. do it. I was advising a big name media person right now has launched his own thing to, about live reads. I, I, I'll do them, but here's how I decided I'd want to do them. I look around my house my space. And I look at the things that I have that I use that I like, and I will sell the things that I use and like and endorse. Yes. But I won't sell as I had to at Sirius XM. Yes, indeed. The, my pillow, because it's like sleeping on a, a, a sack of onions. I won't sell oil. I won't sell uh, guns right. and ammo, Christian mingle, you know, anti-gay stuff. I won't, do those things because I don't believe in those things. And if I, and it's it one thing possible. if it's on my show, it's a different thing if it's, hi, I'm Pete Dominic, and I think oil, guns, and Christianity are the way to go. <laughs> it is possible to have advertising and keep your soul. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm on a podcast every week called This Week in Google. Yeah, on the Twitter yeah I love that this podcast. Test, right? The video. And, I watched the video, the YouTube um, show. Uh, so, so Leo Laporte, who runs it, he has a very strict policy. And if he doesn't like the advertiser, he won't take the ad, period. Uh, and, and he gives up ads all the time. And, and um, that's a hard way to make a, a living in a business. But I think it's possible. Um, now, having said that, should the New York Times endorse every ad that's in it? No. But should the New York Times have limits? Yes. Should the Washington Post have limits? Yes. And you've got to have... Uh, limits that I think are transparent and that people can hold you accountable to. And that's what people were asking of Facebook. Uh, that was the irony of the, of, the, of the Columbia Journalism Review piece by Bill Gruskin, is that the Washington Post was holding Facebook's feet to the fire for their policies around political advertising, and the Washington Post didn't follow right. it themselves. Right. So now we know what their standards are because they said it, and, and now we're holding them to the fire. I love talking to you. We got a great perspective on you. so many different things. It's so great to talk to you. And uh, let's do it again very soon, Jeff Jarvis. I hope so, my friend. Thank you. Man, I love talking to that guy. You know, Howard Stern loves Jeff Jarvis. Every once in a while, you'll hear Jeff call in to Howard's show. He must have a special number. I, I should ask him about that. Jeff's the whole history of his relationship with Howard Stern, but I think it was something about that Jeff Jarvis recognized Stern's brilliance and uh, innovations in talk radio early on when everybody else was criticizing him. I think it's something like that, but I really don't know the story behind that. But I should ask him, and he should, uh, and he'll share it next time he joins me. I love having Jeff on. I would talk to that guy a lot more. Do you guys like Jeff Jarvis? I love me some Jarvis. Such great perspectives and interesting ideas and opinions on all things journalism and media, and love talking to him about it all. Great guy, just a, just a great guy. As are so many, most of the guests that join me, many of which I've become good friends with, including Jeff. All right, well, I'm out of time. That's it. Andrew Spar and Jeff Jarvis, both friends, both brilliant guys, and both I thank greatly for joining me here on the podcast. That's what you're going to get here every day, Monday through Friday. The smartest folks I can find. You guys keep coming up with great ideas for people for me to talk to as well. So keep them coming. Uh, send me guests in the subject to stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com and put in the subject guest ideas, guest referrals, something regarding guests. That's how I organize things, everybody. Have you figured it out yet? All right. I am out of time. I hope you're all right. I do want to share real quick one poignant thing for those of you still listening. You get this treat. We do these uh, Zoom hangouts with paid subscribers, and I host them, and we hang out. Sometimes I get a guest. Last week, it was Glenn Kirshner. I've had Eric Siegel and Aaron Carroll and uh, my friend, Professor Kenneth C. Davis, as well, on history. I think that's all of the folks that have joined me. And sometimes it's just me and listeners. We usually get around 60 to 70 folks in those Zoom hangouts. 
Anyway, it's a pretty diverse group. And it's unbelievable to me or super special to me when people connect via the stand-up community. And my one of my dreams is to create a platform for this community to be more connected. If you want to be, you don't have to be. Maybe you're just listening to a podcast and that's, that's it. But if you want to be part of the, uh, more of an active part of the community who can connect with other folks, especially during this insane, unique, crazy time that seems like it's becoming our new normal of self-isolation and quarantine and working from home and all that, it's a good place to be right now. So sign up for a paid subscription and become part of the community and be like Karen Madison, who reached out to two other ladies who are part of the community and apparently jumped on a Zoom call of their own. Karen told me that and it made me so elated, so fulfilled with purpose and and a sense of importance. I guess that's ego, but it but to some extent doesn't that matter that that, 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 that what you're doing matters is purpose driven? Don't you want, not necessarily your job, but you want something in your life that's purpose-driven? I feel like, and if it can be your job, which is what I've made this podcast, then amazing. I've made this career. But the idea that these three women connected is, is so super special and amazing to me. And it gives me a real purpose and drive to continue doing this each and every day. I hope you'll become part of our community and sign up. Paid subscription link. That's how you can support this independent media venture where I get all the best guests and have long-form conversations with policy experts and you, listeners. You want to talk? Let me know. Reach out. Standupwithpete at gmail.com. You're not alone. I love you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow right here and Stand Up.